what we want to do is, again, use one of three methods. The first or the most rudimentary method is to use your marquee selection tool. I prefer the polygon because it allows us to click point to point. And so we, we have less opportunity for error for human shake if or we're not really good with our mouse. The downside of it is it's like making little cuts with scissors. And um, it, it's very time consuming. So we can't have nice curves. But it does work. Uh, it's, it's, it's very intuitive. And, and I think it's, it's a good basic solution. So on this one, I would click point, 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 wherever I, I see a, a change in, in direction or shape. I'm just going to do it really fast, and I'm not going to grab all of him. We'll just cut his head off here and come down, and we'll say that's our selection. And again, to close any of the lasso tool selections, we just either double-click or go back to the original starting point. And then we have that selection. From here, we could get our move tool and drag the piece that we want to the other um, what's the word? Or to our other canvas which is a, a quick, easy way just to not have to delete anything. We can also, if it's not a background layer, we can double click it, click on our mask tool and just mask out the area so we're not doing any deleting. And then we can modify that mask using our painting tools. So we can click on the mask, get a paintbrush, have it be either a black or white paintbrush, which we'll either add to or take away from our current selection. And we can make modifications or adjustments to it. And I can go into this a little more in depth next week. Um, we won't need this skill necessarily for today, but if, if those are skills that you guys think are, are helpful, we can review it next week a little bit. So that's another way to do it. Um, kind of the, the ghetto way to do it is to have your selection. I'll just pretend this is our detailed selection. Go select, inverse, and hit our delete key, and then deselect it. I used Command D as my shortcut on that, and that gives us the um, cutout background. Now on a very intricate piece of line art, like uh, some of the things that we did last time, you may have to just recreate it or find a filter or something that will help you along the way. Um, but this is a, a quick, easy way to, to make a, a detailed selection. Let me show you the other more advanced. I won't show you the middle way, and if we want to learn the middle way, we can do that again next week. But a more advanced option is actually using our pen tool. So let me go back into time here. Actually, I'll just close this and do it on another one. So if I wanted to, to select around her or select a flower, let's just do a flower. Usually, to get a nice detailed selection, you want to zoom in pretty close to the object because you're going to have areas that are kind of what I call the fringe or the, 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 the halo or glow around an object. And that's it's like kind of the object, but it's kind of what's behind the object too. And you usually want to cut on the inside of that so you don't have a little artifact or a little fake outline around what you're cutting. So if you zoom in, that's really helpful. I'm using Command Plus or Command Minus on my keyboard that's a shortcut to zoom in and out of your object and then your spacebar allows you to move around on the canvas so if you hold down your spacebar it will turn to your little hand if I wanted to select out this flower I could use a pen tool and those of you who are not familiar with vector again we can talk about this next week but if you, you know how to use it you simply come over here to your options bar make sure that you have um, your paths option selected so that it's only drawing a path but not filling an object. And here I'm using curves and straight lines. Uh, this obviously doesn't have straight lines, but to make oops, to make a detailed selection that is very controlled and very clean of my object. And I'm being a little lazy here, but you can see that as many points as you want to put in there, the better once you have that. You can go to your Paths palette, hold down your Command key and click it, and it will turn that path into a selection. So that's advanced Photoshop. The first one's beginning, and the middle is kind of intermediate. So if you guys would like to look, learn a little more about that next week, um, actually, let's just take a show of hands. Who would like to go over some selection tools next week? So it looks like more than half. We'll do that, OK? Um, but th those are things that will help you in, in 
getting rid of backgrounds. There's also, you know, magic wand tools and stuff, but uh, these are, are much more professional and going to give you a better result. So does that sort of answer your question? We'll, we'll look at the file individually after and see if there was something going on with it, but... Okay, other questions? Were you guys just a screencast question? Awesome. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's hop into our subject for today. Uh, a lot of times, um, should I stop the recording and then start again when I work, or do you guys want to hear? Does it matter? I'll just leave it. Okay, a lot of times uh, you'll be called to, to work on an assignment that, that would require illustration. Um, illustration is a, a very broad term. It can be anywhere from sketching or line art all the way to a, to a full painting or even something in between or a composite with a photograph and a painting. And Photoshop is a terrific tool to paint with and to draw with. Um, preferably if you're doing line art, you're using a vector program maybe first and then importing that into Photoshop, although Photoshop has some of those capabilities, it's just not the best tool for it. What we're going to talk a little bit about today is more stylistic illustration, so pixel-based. So how do we take a photograph or a, an object that has been captured digitally and turn it into a piece, something that looks like a piece of artwork? And uh, it could be just translating it to look painted, or it could be actually creating a completely new look, a composited look, um, something very stylistic. Uh, one great thing about Photoshop is it allows us, um, that's this different from traditional illustration, it allows us to make changes at any time to resize, recolor, reconfigure, recomposite things. And so when we're done with the painting, we still have a bazillion other options that we could do later on, especially if we save all of our layers in Photoshop. Now some artists that use Photoshop for painting will have uh, like a Wacom tablet or you know a pen, a stylus that they'll use, but it's not necessary. You can definitely do things with a mouse, and um, some start from scratch and use it more as a coloration tool. Others start with photographs as a, a reference point or trace. We're going to talk about a few different ways to do it today. Nothing that requires a ton of art skill, but just requires a set of um, a set of uh, procedures or a, a set of uh, what's the word disciplines that depending on how you like uh, to work and depending on the result that you want to get, you know, can go from being very, very easy to not difficult, but require a little more artistic uh, decision making. When you see something that is digitally um, enhanced, so it's a photograph that's turned into a watercolor painting or something, and it's just used to fill, uh, it's just accomplished by using a filter, you immediately know it. And uh, I think you guys have seen these things before. You walk into a mall and there's a little kiosk that you can sit in there. It takes your picture and then it has some little hand go across the screen. And the screen that's supposed to make it look like you have a drawing. Have you guys seen these before? Or a painting or, um, you know, there's lots of, it, it's not as bad as it used to be, but there were lots of uh, companies that were using in their marketing collateral these really canned looking illustrations. The reason why I bring illustration into this class is because again it gets us pushing pixels around, it allows us to understand blend modes, it allows us to understand um, color and composition and layering which will help us if we don't do illustration with our photo sweetening and, and our layouts and our ability really to take a project from a very rough state and hone it into something that, that's very thematic and, and, and has personality. So that said, let me show you some examples of some paintings that I did quite some time ago in Photoshop, and I, I hope you'll realize that these paintings look more realistic or legitimate than just some filter. Um, and again, you can go all the way legitimate in Photoshop, or you can use some of the tricks and techniques I'll teach you today to, to accomplish some pretty great things without being an artist. So, these are just a few. This was a uh, and the color on the screen is never awesome, so I'm going to throw an adjustment layer over the top of this to see if I can make these look a hair better. Is there a little dark? Um, this is actually a picture of my grandfather. He has a, a tw or had a twin brother, and this is a, a painting. It was based off a couple of photographs I had, and it's uh, meant to look um, like it's done with uh, with watercolors. But it was all done in Photoshop, so if I want to pull one of them out and change the color of their shirt or 
throw a tornado in the background or whatever. It's really, really easy to do. I don't know why I said tornado. This is uh, an example of like an oil pastel. So it was a, a picture of a park. Um, I think I maybe in London or somewhere I took a picture and gone in and, and made it look like it was done with pastels. And these again, with if you do it in Photoshop with the right resolution, it's very scalable. And so when you're making prints, you can make put one on a greeting card, you can put one on a poster, you can put it on your website, change the colors and the theme. Uh, this was a canal in Venice. This is meant to look like it was painted with a uh, a palette knife. This I was watching Ocean's Eleven and Brad Pitt was sitting at a bar and there was just really cool light on him. He had this really funky shirt and so I decided to uh, to paint it and so that was just done in Photoshop. Um, at Old Main everybody's painted that. Uh, picture of the Colosseum in Rome again kind of a palette knife technique you'll notice. Um, some characteristics we'll go over specifically on the paintings are there's, there's thickness, so you're seeing that there's levels to the paint, which makes it look much more realistic than if it's flat, depending on the type. Um, looks like it was painted on a canvas because we have some texture here, but we also don't have a completely clean edge, so that helps. Um, this was a watercolor of my wife and our, our little baby a long time. We actually printed this big and it, and it looked really nice. This was a, an old farmer in a field. It's kind of a, a mixture between some water, watercolor and oil techniques. That's a really rough palette, or a, like a palette knife type painting of a bridge when I was experimenting. It's a little more detailed watercolor. It's a picture I took at Leeds Castle in London, or England, and uh, painted. Again, a real rough, weird thing. <laughs> and same movie, Ocean's Eleven, George Clooney sitting in prison. I was just goofing around and decided to paint it. So some of these are pretty much completely freehand in Photoshop. Others are using like a photo reference. Um, but the skills that I'll teach you today, you could accomplish all these things um, without too much trouble. So I want to talk a little bit about characteristics of an illustration, or at least as it's going to apply to our assignment in this class. Um, some things that make it look more legitimate than just running it through a watercolor filter, which maybe you've done before, or a dry brush filter, is that there is some kind of a style associated with it. And style is a difficult word to define when it comes to painting and, and to, to illustrating because there are so many features. But um, suffice it to say, if it has a style, it looks like it was done by a human for a specific purpose. It doesn't have that digital, very predictable look. It has um, some anomalies. Some, some things, uh, some biases that we make decisions as we're painting or drawing. And so we have to, to look at it and say, uh, we have to make some decisions within our painting, maybe not to make every line completely straight or use every blade of grass in the, the picture that we're painting, but to, to paint in blocks, things like that. Um, fewer more saturated um, colors always make something look more like a painting than a photograph, unless you're trying to hit surrealism, which is a whole other class we're going to go over. Thickness or depth of paint can make something look real or fake. Having canvas or paper, which is usually meaning there's texture or there's tooth or color to, to what you're doing. One great thing in Photoshop is you can paint something and you can apply 10 different paper styles to it. Parchment, you can make it look like it was painted on cardboard, you can make it look like it was on a canvas, whatever, and it changes the theme completely. You can also go from a piece of white paper to a piece of like kind of burnt orange or, or gold paper or you could go to a completely black sheet of paper and where you have some opacity in your painting, that's going to show through and it's going to change the feel of it. So that's really nice. You cannot do that with a traditional painting. And then the last thing, and this is just silly, but by adding your signature on it and making sure your signature is done by hand and you're not typing it in Comic Sans, it makes it look like it was really done as a, as a painting. So. A few quick tricks for you. Uh, things are, these are things I will look for in the painting assignment that you're going to do and that will automatically make it look legitimate even if you suck <laughs> as a painter, right? Mm -hmm. So um, what I want to do is distribute a file to you guys and really just start working on it. If you uh, have your computers turned on, hopefully this shows up the right way. Let's see. All computers.
this folder will be called Lesson 3 Students. Within this folder, you're going to have some assignment. Uh, you're going to have uh, an assignment graphic, which will show you what our assignment is, a bunch of numbered images, which will you can work on alongside me here. You've got uh, some videos um, and some examples of, of paintings here that you can pull apart. There's another one that, that shows thickness. And here's one that's really simple, but you can actually bust it down. It shows you all the Photoshop layers of a frog. So you should have everything that you need in here. Additionally, um, I have put in here, I thought I did, that syllabus. Am I missing it? Oh my word, I did it twice today. Um, let me see if I can access and get it to you at the break. If not, I will send it to you for sure. Oh, no, there it is. Yay, so there's your syllabus with both pages. <laughs> so you should have everything you need. So has that showed up on your desktop? No. No, or yes? That's Standing the by. No. Standing by still? Oh, never mind. Looks like we're 90% in progress. Okay, what I want to do is start with, oops, start with what I, I call kind of an automatic painting technique. Let me just get rid of this thing. Um, and so this is an automatic oil painting technique. This requires no brush strokes or no special, um, I don't know what that is, uh, no special artistic skill for many of you. Um, it's not the way I suggest you paint for this assignment, but it's, it's a way. If you want to open up the file that says auto paint, it looks like this, and open it in Photoshop. I've actually got the instructions here that we can kind of go along with together to try to achieve a painting. Now before you do any painting, uh, you probably want to adjust your levels, your saturation, and your sharpness for whatever your purpose will be with the painting. Um, your levels are, again, your lights, darks, and mid-values. Your saturation is how intense the color is. And then sharpness is uh, basically the, the overall appearance of detail or resolution in your image. Um, the fewer colors that you have represented and the more vivid they are, the easier it will translate into a painting. So for something like this, I might go into my image, adjustments, hue saturation, and bump the saturation up a little bit. So if you look at that um, versus, let's see, get my history palette up, we're just a little bit brighter. Now one thing with painting is, uh, depending on your style, and in most cases, you want things to be a little bit better than real life. And so I think it's okay to kind of cheat the photos up a bit, especially if it's a landscape. If it's a person, you don't want to turn them a crazy color. Um, but with something like this, you know, who knows what reality really is anyways, right? So you can adjust that. You can adjust your levels. Uh, again, let's go to Edit, Adjust Levels, or Command-L on your keyboard brings your levels up. And I usually kind of lighten up some of the mid values a little bit so it doesn't get muddy. So those are a few things you can do to prepare your image again based on how you want things to look at look uh, when you're complete. On this one um, the first thing I'm going to do is go into a filter. Uh, the filter is the distort filter. I think last week I mentioned though anytime I start a technique I like to make a copy of whatever I'm going to do the technique on in case I screw it up. My mouse is having trouble. There we go, by dragging it, the little piece of paper icon. And uh, then that way, if I screw up, I always have the original that I can, can reference. So I've got this copy that I'm going to work on. I go to my filter menu, and I'm going to distort. 
and I'm going to glass, which is the third one down. So it's a little awkward, you think. I'm making a painting. Why would I want to use glass to store it? But this gives you a much more unpredictable, natural look to a painting. Once you have that, I'm going to see what I used here. I used 3-3 canvas 80% as my adjustment. You can do whatever you want here, but it looks like the when I experimented with, minted with this, I used the distortion at 3. Smoothness is free. The texture I moved to canvas, which gives you a very different look than frosted. And then I left the scan or I put the scaling at 80%. There isn't a rule here, it's just you want to look at this object and see how you can kind of rough it up a little bit. Again, it's not going to be a finished painting, but it's uh, it's going to be a, a base or a start for you. And then click OK. From here, I'm going to use another filter on the exact same layer. I'm going to go Filter, Artistic, and I'm going to go to Paint Dobbs. Once I'm at Paint Dobbs, I've got, again, some options. For brush size, I think I did four. Sharpness, let me see what I did one and then simple on the brush type. Can you say those again? Sure. So we're in paint daubs, brush size four, sharpness one, brush type simple. And again, you can kind of eyeball this. Now you notice immediately, and you probably see it better on your screen than you do up here, you're getting some nice stuff in here that you wouldn't have gotten with just the glass or with another, uh, just using one filter. Mountains uh, start to look like they were painted in and click OK. Then I'm going to add some some brush strokes using the same object just doing it to filter. I'm going to go to filter, brush strokes, and then I'm going to go down to angled strokes and I am going to put 4630. So the direction I had is 46, no magic formula there. Stroke, stroke length just at three. I don't want it to be too harsh and the sharpness at zero. 46, three, and zero. And then I'm going to hit OK. So I've applied three filters a distort glass filter, an artistic paint daub filter, and then a brush, brush stroke filter. The last thing that I can do is I could add a canvas to this. And this is the ghetto way to do it. I'll show you a better way later on. But all you need to go do is go up to your filter menu, go to texturizer, which is uh, under your texture option here. So filter, texture, texturizer. And then here choose some appropriate numbers. It will automatically come up with a, text, a canvas texture option. You have others, but canvas is the most appropriate. You can reduce the scaling increase or reduce the relief of the texture, get it how you'd like it, and then click OK. Now this is a much more realistic painting than where we had before. It's not perfect, but it's, uh, it's better than, again, using just one filter in Photoshop. To make it look a little more legitimate, a couple tricks would be create a new layer on top of it, get white paint, and get a paintbrush and then within your paintbrushes you have some options in here and you can choose whatever you like what I'm going to do is create a mask around the edge basically a frame around the edge make it look really tough or sorry rough and instead of painting out into it I'm cropping it in so I will just choose uh, this brush this one that's 40 whatever 40 or 65 now um, pixels and I'm just going to come onto these edges. Basically, all I'm doing is painting white paint over the top of my image. I'm not hurting or harming my image. I'm creating kind of a false mask. And I can do this really quick, roughly, and then I can come back with some smaller brushes and add some more detail. I'm clicking, click, 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 click. So I can go ahead and do that. Now I can grab let's say a smaller version or a different type of a brush. Wow, that one's crazy. And maybe I'll take my opacity on this one and reduce it so that when I start to brush away, it's not full, full steam ahead. It's just parts of it, which will create the feeling like it's kind of melting or fading off a little bit. 
So if I come in here, you see as I start to paint, I'm losing some, but not all of my image. And if you zoom in and spend some time on this, you can make it look really quite realistic. So we'll pretend like that's good. Click off that. And then the last thing I want to do with this image is I want to put a, a, a signature on it. And again, ghetto way to do it is just go ahead and create a new layer, get a color. Let's just use red so we see it to start off with. Get a paintbrush. I just get one of the, the paintbrushes that's completely smooth, round, and has hard edges, kind of like a marker. I'll reduce the size a little bit, and then I'm just going to hand write my name. Oops. Make sure my opacity is up all the way. I'm going to hand write my name like I'm going to sign it. Way too big, but what's our command to make something small? Command T. Command T bring it down to whatever size we want, move it to wherever it makes sense on the canvas, I don't know. We'll probably have to change the color because you're kind of losing it there. And then to easily change the color, we can use our layer, um, layer effects, layer styles, which is the little effects button, color overlay. We can make it white if we wanted. That'll show up. Click OK, OK, and there's my my little name. How are we doing? Which brush was that that you used? I just grabbed a uh, a circle, so it's it's a <coughs> default brush. It's one of these here at the top that just has a hardness of a hundred percent. If not, then it's going to come out more like spray paint, which doesn't really fit this style. Oh, okay. And then you can adjust the size, but it's way easier to make it big and then condense it using your free transform than to try to write it out, the finished size. And then from there, once you get it, you can adjust the color by just using a, a color effect or a layer style. How do you make it smaller? Um, so any, any object, if you use con Command T, that's your free transform, that'll just, yep, resize it for you. So I'm going to leave this up here for just a second. If you wanted to write it down, if you didn't get all the, the uh, all of the tasks, let me do this so we don't add anything extra to it. This is basically an automatic oil paint technique. Prepare it by adjusting the size, the levels, the hue saturation. Then use these four. Um, Filters, the distort glass, artistic paint daubs, brush strokes at an angle, and then your texturizer. It would be helpful if I screen capture this and just send it to you. do that. All right, you should have it. That's a lot of steps, um, but it's the way that requires no artistic skill. Um, the next thing I want to teach you is how to make a sketch of something because that will become the base of a lot of the other options or styles that you'll have in Photoshop. Basically a line <coughs> drawing of, of an object. So there is a little movie on here. If you go to, to draw.mov, it will show you exactly how okay, to do you this. A child and make it look like Let me reduce my uh, volume here. So you take this picture of a kid and then you end up with something like this. So I will show you how to do that right now, but keep in mind that you'll have all those steps in that little movie. If you take uh, file number two called Sketch and bring it into Photoshop, got a picture of this guy. We want to make him a line drawing. It's very simple, but there are I think, four or five steps. So write these down or just feel confident that you have it in the movie. I'm going to copy the background so I have a copy of him. 
I'm going to go image, adjustments, desaturate. I'm going to pull the color out. You could also just go into hue saturation and pull the saturation back, but Photoshop gave you a quick desaturate button. So now he's a black and white image. Then I'm going to copy him. So now there's two black and white images on top of each other. And the top one I want to invert. That doesn't make sense to us right now, but it will in a minute. And basically to invert him is going to make him look evil. Image, adjustments, invert. And it's going to be like a photo negative. It's the opposite of what we were seeing before. And he does look evil. They got cat eyes, right? From here, I need to change up layer blend mode. Right now, we're on normal. I want to look to, I believe it's color dodge. I can't remember. I'll have to try. Yep. You know you've gotten it right because what it does is it takes the positive image, the negative image, and where they overlap, it cancels everything out. So we end up with a white canvas. You can see we still have those two layers. We've got the demonic guy here and his alter ego here. But the way that they're interacting with each other because we changed the blend mode to color dodge instead of normal is that basically they're canceling each other out. And here's where the magic occurs. We can now go into our filter menu and go to a blur, Gaussian blur. And what it does is it offsets the top layer by whatever pixel dimension we give the blur, which gives us these lines. So well, can you repeat that again? Sure. Sorry. What did the action before, like, do you, like when we type in white? Like, when, I mean, like page chat. Uh-huh. So we, before this. Said color dodge these. Color dodge, basically, it takes, I, I can't give you the scientific explanation, but it takes the positive and negative and it cancels them out. So we have basically two polar opposites on top of each other, and because black is on top of white and white is on top of black, they interact in, in basically saying, I'm not going to reveal anything now. And then when we blur it, right now they're calibrated perfectly. When we blur it, we offset them slightly, and then it shows the offset. And the offset gives us all the lines and details of areas that have either high contrast um, or, or uh, well, actually just areas that have high contrast. So where there's black and white touching, and they offset, and it gives you what looks like a hard line. Where's the button for the dodge? It's right here at the top in your layers palette, where it says normal no normally. You change that to color dodge. Now, keep in mind these layer blend modes up here are not permanent changes. They are basically the way that Photoshop is going to reveal the document or display the document, but you haven't hurt your image. You can change it back to normal or to something else at any time. Um, but as soon as I go to my filter menu and go blur, Gaussian blur, it allows me to change that image, basically blur it up and offset it, and depending on the radius, gives me the appearance of some lines and some details, which is more in line with a sketch. Right Now your screen's a little blown out. If you're working along with me, you'll notice there's detail here with his nose and his eyes. It's a little bit light. We can bring that back out, but we're getting kind of a good outline of, of his face. So I'm going to click OK, and then I'm going to take these two layers, so his original black and white layer, his demonic blurred self now with the color dodge applied to it, and I'm going to merge them so that they're just one layer. So no longer are we working with two layers to give us this image, but we actually merge them together to give us a final image. So to do that, I just need to either command click or shift click the two layers. So I'm selecting multiple layers at one time. And then go over here to my menu and do merge layers. It's basically going to melt them into one. Now from here, I need to just do a couple little adjustments. It's a little bit light for me, so I'm going to go Image, Adjustments, Levels. Where are we? Right at the top. And I will pull my dark ones over and my mid ones over a little bit. You'll notice, whoa, there we go. You notice it kind of deepens or darkens up some of these lines and brings out some more of these details here. Again, my screen looks a little different than yours. And click OK. 
And this gives me a pretty good line drawing representation of this guy. And then from here, if I wanted to add the appearance of maybe some cross hatching or some pencil lines or, or strokes, it's really easy. I just need to copy him. So now I have, again, two identical images on top of each other. Go into the copy, go to filter, go into brush strokes, and choose some kind of a stroke. These filters basically are going to junk up or, or mess with our existing pixels and give them characteristics of cross hatching or whatever. We don't need to worry how they work, we just need to know that they do work. We go into cross hatch, which is the technique in art where your shading is basically making kind of a basket weave. You have lines going one way and then opposing way. And you see it gives me all this cross hatching. You can adjust this to whatever you like. Doesn't look good as it is, but because we're going to composite, we made a copy, we can use our opacity tool in a second and our eraser tool to make it look good. So I'm going to click OK. So I got bogus guy on top of the original guy. This looks pretty fake to me. Looks digital, right? If I pull the opacity back a little bit so it's more subtle, it makes it a little more realistic, right? And then I get an eraser. And you choose a soft eraser, whatever size is applicable to what you're doing. And then I'm going to go ahead and, looks like my opacity is not at 100%. I'll put it at 75 I'm going to go ahead and click and erase some of those crosshatch lines that I don't think are necessary. They make it overkill and then keep, like I like these ones down here on his chin. I like them around his eyebrows. I don't like them here. And I'm just going to make some decisions of where they're good and where they're bad, which is going to make this, again, look less predictable and less digital. And again, let me see if I can adjust my levels a little bit to give you guys a little better vision of what I'm looking at. Not really. <laughs> um, it's much more realistic uh, than any other filter that you could use in Photoshop. Again, now I have two layers. I've got the crosshatch on top of him. If I want to merge those, I shift click, click them, come over here, merge layers. Now they're the same layer. One place where this is really helpful, um, so we're going to see how we use this in paintings, but is also in creating some style in photographs. It, we can use this almost like a sharpening layer. So if I change it from normal to multiply, up here in my layer blend modes, it kicks out all the white. And you see what it does to his picture? It gives us a little more stylistic look. And then we can adjust the opacity and say, you know what, that looked no good but I like a little bit of it. It adds a little more definition or character, makes it a little more dynamic as a photo. Did you just do that? I took the, the layer of our sketch oh, okay. and I changed it from normal to multiply. And once you're in multiply, basically that, if you remember what I gave you that sheet on the layer blend mode last week, that kicks all the white out and it allows all the dark colors to multiply or basically to composite together. And then I adjust the opacity and make that more or less dramatic, depending on what looks right to me. All right, so that can be a photo technique you can use later on. It can be a sketch technique. And it also can be a way to help us end up with a painting um, that looks uh, proportional and, and looks nice. And you'll see that in a second. So if you didn't get all the, the steps in that, you, again, you have the movie. And you can, it'll go through step by step and you can pause it. Um, I, you know, we've already gone through what, 50 minutes of class. And there's like a zillion things I could teach you. And we only have one semester to do it. So I'd rather give you some more things. And hopefully with this screencast, that helps you guys. Um, but let's, uh, let's make sure we, we, nobody feels too lost. But again, you don't need to know all the things. We're just going to try to give you skills so that you can do a painting. Um, if you want to jump to number three, the pattern stamp, and open this up. This is the second technique that you could use in creating a painting. The first one was the automatic. This is kind of the semi-automatic. And then we're going to go way more manual in a second. 
So if you want to get this opened up with me, that's great. First thing I do is copy it so that I have two copies. I do that on most techniques. Next thing I do is I need to actually put into my clipboard or my memory on my computer this image. So I need to do a copy. You know, we have copy and paste. You can do that in Photoshop. But I need to let Photoshop know what I want to copy. So I'm just going to go ahead and drag a selection from side to side so I have the whole thing selected. If you don't want to do it manually, you can do um, Command A. That means select all. But make sure you have the little marching ants around your whole image. From here, you're going to go to your edit menu, and you're going to go down to define pattern. What we're going to do is we're going to allow Photoshop to copy this into its memory as a pattern. And then we're going to express that pattern or paint that pattern out. So I'm going to say define pattern, and I can give it a name. I can call it Freants and click OK. Now this will forever be saved in my Photoshop preferences and memory. So if you ever need to per use it again, you've got it. If you want to purge it out, you can. But it's basically been sucked into Photoshop as a pattern that I like. From here, I can deselect it. I don't need a selection anymore. And I need to create two layers, a layer to paint on and a piece of paper. That'll make sense here as I show you. I'm going to create two layers. Boop, boop. I just click the new layer icon twice. The top one I'll just double click and call paint. You don't have to do that, but it's nice. And the next one, paper. The paper layer, I'm going to go ahead and fill with white and say I'm going to make this white paper to start with by just getting white as my foreground color, getting a paint bucket tool and popping it in. That immediately covers our other layers, the two layers of the Eiffel Tower. If we want to start painting and we don't want to just paint from our memory or freehand, we better have a pretty good idea of where the tower's at. So what I can do with this paper layer is I can adjust the opacity and make it kind of like a piece of tracing paper that when I'm finished with my painting, I'll go ahead and put all the way back up to full opacity. But as I paint, it allows me to kind of see my subject. Okay? So quick review. I took my object. I selected it all. I went into my edit. Define pattern. So Photoshop sucked it into its memory. Then I created two new layers. One of them I just filled with white, and that's going to be my paper layer. And I pulled the opacity back so I could still see my subject. And the next one I just put on top as a paint layer. I haven't done anything on that one yet. But that's where I'm actually going to paint brush strokes. From here, it's pretty automatic. I click on my paint layer. I come over to a tool you, maybe you haven't used before. It's just under your paintbrush, and it looks like a rubber stamp. We've used the clone before, probably, right, where we are doing some things where we suck up a pattern and drop it somebody, somewhere else. We kind of stamp things out. It's used often in photo editing. But the pattern stamp, many of you probably have not used. If you select it, it's the little stamp tool that has the checkerboard next to it. Again, on any of these tools, you click and hold, and it will give you the other options located in that toolbar. So I got the pattern stamp tool here, and I got a few options up here at the top. The first one is the brush. So if I want to do a painting, I might want to choose a brush that looks more like a paintbrush. So I'll just choose something that I think might work. You can load more brushes into Photoshop. You can go buy brushes. That's limitless. You can make brushes. We'll learn how to do that in the class. Um, I'm going to leave my mode at normal. My opacity, I could adjust if I wanted to. I'll leave it at 100% to start. Flow, I'll leave. But you notice right here, there's these bubbles. This is a predetermined pattern in Photoshop that if I start painting, I'll just start painting bubbles. Because Photoshop said, I'm going to give you some patterns that I think might be useful. <laughs> <laughs> right? But this pattern stamp technique that we're using probably wasn't thought of as a painting technique. It was probably thought of as, hey, if you want a repeating pattern, go ahead and sample it, shove it into Photoshop using that defined pattern tool, and then you can use it for your layer styles, you can paint with it, whatever. We've got to click here and find our Eiffel Tower. There it is. And then we want to look at these options here and how they affect us. Um, 
This, if you have a tablet, allows you to control the pressure. So how hard you push means how hard or how opaque the paint gets. We don't have a tablet, but we can still push that and, and uh, pretend. doesn't make a difference. We can click Impressionistic if we want it to be a little more liberal in the way it applies paint. And Aligned um, gives us a more predictable result, so I like to turn it off because we kind of like or unpredictability. And then we can come over here to our object and click, and we can start to, oops, you know what? Maybe I want aligned. Oop, oop, oop. Got to get on my paint layer there. There we go. Never mind, aligned I do want. It's in another technique I don't. What you want to do is click and drag, and you will start to get the colors that were originally there on the object and you will be able to start painting. Now this Eiffel Tower is going to look a little bit weird in the beginning, but the more you click and drag, and the, the more we come back with sketch techniques, it actually gets kind of cool. So I'm going to click, 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 click. I can change the size of my brush. I can be more bold or less bold with my strokes. I could change my opacity. So if I hit it, it hits it at partial, and then that way when I hit multiple times, it kind of gives me a little bit of a layering effect almost like a watercolor wash. Come down here in the trees, paint in some trees. And what I tend to do with a technique like this is I tend to start off very rough, just like this, on one layer. And this is kind of a, a technique in um, traditional painting calling blocking in your subjects or blocking in your color. What's that? Like Bob Ross. Like Bob Ross. This is like... You want to start in the background. Yes. Yep, do some almighty trees and grow yourself an awesome afro. Yeah. Little, happy little tree. Happy, happy tree. Little yeah. If you're not enjoying it, you got a problem. Don't paint. So anyways, go through this, and you can see that you start to get some painterly technique. Once you have it roughed in, then you can create another layer on top of it if you'd like. And you can get a smaller brush, and you can go in and paint over the top and start to get some more details. And I won't bore you with this, but you can basically paint in as much detail as you want. The smaller the brush and the smaller the clicks, the more detail allows to come through. Now, when you have it how you like it, then you can take your piece of paper and you can turn it all the way up so that we don't see the background there anymore. And then if you think it needs a little more definition, that sketch technique I talked about can be applied over the top. So check this out. I'm going to do this fast, but I'm going to grab the background again, image, adjustments, desaturate. I'll go ahead and turn these off so we can watch it happen. Copy, image, adjustments, evil, I mean invert. <laughs> Normal, color, dodge, filter, blur, Gaussian blur. Slightly offset, okay. Merge them together. Merge layers. Move it on top. I won't even add the cross hatching. Of course, it's not showing anything through, but if I change it from normal to multiply, it gets rid of all the white. And you start to see some of these things through, right? And then you can pull the opacity back, and you will, you will see more of the detail in this case of the tower. It'll give it a little more sketchy technique. And then, again, once you have it all painted in, go ahead and wash out the background a little bit. Pull in some, uh, pull in your textures, your, uh, your, your, your signature, and you'll get a, actually quite a good painting. It's amazing how well this one works. Now, I'll also tell you, if you want to add thickness, there's kind of a MacGyver way to do it, and that is to use a layer style. When you get all done with this, if you want to click a new layer and uh, go in, right, or pay attention to this. If I take, um, let's say, uh, just a regular paintbrush, let's get it kind of as a chunky one, make it a little bigger, and I paint white paint right there. Um, I've basically got a layer that has. Uh, some kind of a graphic applied to it with full opacity. If I go and to my FX and go down to bevel and emboss, 
it creates a little shadow and highlight on my, my image, which makes it look a little bit 3D. And I can change that around. There's lots of ways to, to manipulate it. Click OK. We'll say this is good. Right now, this does not look like thickness. It just looks like somebody took white and threw over the top. We want the paint to look thick. So I need to keep the bevel and emboss, the highlight and the shadow, but get rid of the white paint. If I adjust the opacity, it gets rid of the highlight, the shadow, and the white paint at the same time. If I adjust the fill, it respects my layer style. If you took the beginning class, we did this on some 3D buttons. It respects my layer style, but gets rid of what's on the layer. So if I pull this back, you see how it creates kind of what looks like some thickness. Now I could come along here and say, OK, I want to paint in some areas that look kind of thick. Maybe it's too thick so I can adjust my bevel and emboss and make it less depth or whatever. But you can see here, can you guys see these little things? You can actually see my brush strokes over the top. This is similar to a technique, and I forget what the term is, I should know, is it cliche or something, where an artist makes a print, and then to sell it for more money, they print on canvas, they actually take a, a, a paintbrush with some varnish or something, and they paint some little strokes on it which makes it look like it's more of an original. So this is something that, again, adds depth. You can erase these. You can paint them in, paint them out. You can adjust the opacity of the whole thing if you want to make it more or less subtle. But this is a quick way to get some depth and thickness into your painting. Also, I have given you, because I am an incredible person, a folder called Backgrounds. Double-click that. And you can see there is a variety of papers and canvases. They're supposed to open up. Oh, it doesn't work that way. Papers and canvases for you to try on your image. So I might want to say, what would happen if I got this blank old paper texture, opened it in Photoshop, go ahead and pull it off so I can drag it over to my new object, that I just painted. It's going to cover everything up for now, but I'm going to change it from mul normal to multiply. And I'll pull the opacity so it's not so dark. And I can start to get, this isn't as textured, but I can start to get some color and texture, which gives it a totally different feel. So there's kind of an old burlap paper. Um, I could say, here's linen. That's going to look totally different, right? So let's try linen. Pull it off, drag it over, position it off the Apple T and rotate this one around. And you resize it a little bit. I'll go ahead and hide the brown one. We'll go from normal to multiply in this. And you can start to see some of the linen flex. <coughs> Again, I can adjust the opacity, have it look like it was painted on cloth. Pretty cool, no? Yeah. All right. If you guys want to clap at the end, that's fine. <laughs> no, I think that's awesome. Um, also, if you want to be like so detailed and miss Mr. or Mrs. Art, go ahead and make a layer on top of it. Get a big black paintbrush. I think we discussed this last time about adding kind of a vignette around something, did we? Go ahead and zoom out on it a little bit. And you could darken up some of these corners and give it more of an aged look. So this won't look good to start with. But if I take my opacity now and pull it back, it creates a little more drama. And again, maybe black's not the color. Maybe I go in my color effects and go color overlay. Let's choose kind of a, a rusty brown color. Well, I think you just need a giant tree. A giant? I, just top it off. Yes. Or a, uh, what was the other thing? Some ha happy something. Waterfall, yeah. Ha yeah. I need to, yeah, pay homage to him. Yep. You watched him a lot. I did. He's hypnotic. He's very hypnotic. What are you doing? You're ruining it. Oh, that word. Yeah. Reflections. A lot of reflections he was into, too. All right. So this is, I think, a pretty cool paint technique that... Again, compare this to any filter in Photoshop and you'll come out looking much better. 
All right, I'm now going to teach you my favorite and the one that actually is probably the easiest to set up, but that requires the most amount of decision making. You want to open up the file called Smudge Tool. I gave you three options Matt Damon, <laughs> Home Slice, and uh, high school photo girl, I don't know. I'm going to work on the Matt Damon one for all the chicks in the class. <laughs> oh, that was recorded. Uh, <laughs> all right. Okay, so if we were uh, big, um, crazy fans of Matt Damon and we wanted to paint this picture and have it in our room. But we didn't want it to look, we wanted it to look like something, a piece of art that we went and bought. We wanted to do a great painting of him. We could use that pattern stamp tool. Um, it would look a little bit uh, abstract. We wouldn't get all the detail that we want. Or we could use the technique that I'm going to teach you now um, called the smudge technique. This is pretty incredible how well it works. So I'm going to take this Matt Damon picture. This gives you more of an oil painting look. The pattern stamp you saw looked a little more watercolor. It had more wash to it. This is thick. So I'm going to take this image of Matt Damon, and I'm going to make a copy. I'm going to click a new layer, fill it with white like it's a piece of paper. With my, Where's my paint bucket? Pow. So he disappears. Click a new layer, and that's going to be my paint layer like we've done before. Now the challenge on this one is you're going to have to click back and forth between a couple different views, just the way that it works. I'm going to go ahead and hide my paint, my uh, paper layer right now. I'll call, I'll call this paper just so we're all looking at the same thing. Knowing that I'm going to use it as a reference back and forth to see how my painting's coming along. So I'm not going to throw it away. I'm just going to hide it. Reveal and conceal, clicking that eyeball. Then I'm going to go to my layer that's called paint. And I'm going to zoom in. Now there's nothing on this layer. This is a completely transparent layer. I have a background layer here that I have here just as a reference. I am not really going to use it um, or make any details or changes on it. But I have to allow Photoshop to see it at all times in its full opacity in order for this technique to work. I'm going to run over here to my tools palette and I'm going to find my smudge tool. <coughs> And I think it is, yes, it's, for me, it's underneath this blur tool. It should be underneath your paint bucket if that's the one you were just using. It's the one of the finger pointing like this. So grab your smudge tool. You'll notice that the option bar at the very top looks very similar to what we have when we're using a paintbrush tool. What this option does is it allows us to take pixels or colors and push them around, push them and pull them, push them and pull them, which you can imagine if, if I was a painting and I was my paint hadn't dried and you took and went, rrr, 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 you'd get all these nice little smudgy brush strokes on my face, right? This is kind of what we're going to do to his picture, but we're going to do it on a layer that doesn't have him on it so that when we turn our paper on, you'll see all of our smudging, but you won't see his picture underneath. So watch this. Smudge tool. Get a paintbrush that looks like a paintbrush. Leave your strength at 50. Everything here, leave normal except for sample all layers. If you don't click this, watch what happens. I'm not smudging anything because there's nothing on my layer. What are you, what are you sample layers? Right here at the top, there's a little checkbox. So the magic of this technique is have a copy, paint on top of the copy with your smudge tool, and have sample all layers. Selected. If you start clicking and nothing happens, you know you haven't selected it. Then you come over to the picture of him, and you have to make some artistic decisions. It takes you a second to feel confident, but once you get it, you'll start really cooking. You just click and drag. So you see, I'm dragging under his eye, and I'm, I'm going click, click, click. I don't want to do big, long strokes, because that looks fake. I want to do little, controlled strokes. And I'm looking for direction here. I'm saying... Here's a nice dark area under his eye. In a painting, I wouldn't have 17,000 colors that represent that dark circle. I'd have one or two big blocky colors, and they would follow a certain um, brush direction, right? 
So I'm going to click and drag these. I'm going to click here and come down because this part of his face actually curves the other way. Click, 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 click. And I don't want to see too much striation in what I'm doing because that's going to make it look a little bit unsmooth and flat. But I'm going to have the option when I'm done with all of this to come back and fix some of it. So I'm really, again, trying to block him in. So you'll notice I'm just going to go kind of fast here. Now, in areas of high detail, like his nose right here, I can just do little teeny smudges back and forth, and it will capture that without me having to smudge and try to paint it in. So I'm going click, little microscopic move, click microscopic move, click here, doesn't matter, I can block this thing in. And give me just a second to, to kind of finish this part. I'll even throw in an eyeball, and then we'll see what's happening when we mess with our other layer. This is a good one. I like this one. I knew you would. <laughs> All right. I'm going to zoom in here, get a little smaller paintbrush, and be just a little more careful around his eye. I can almost guarantee that this is the one that everyone's going to do. <laughs> click, 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 click. Okay. Now what I'm going to show you may take your breath away. Um, if anybody's prone to fainting, yeah, please. Uh, Please, yeah, let your, your neighbors know. Okay, so here we go. Zoom back out. Oops. Put out. So we've painted in that part of his face. Oh, wow. right? And it looks much more like a painting because we have these, these big, broad, detailed strokes. Thank you. <laughs> now, when we want to paint again, we've got to turn the layer off and go back. And you can see you could go back and forth on this for quite some time to get get your finished result. Now I'm going to get a bigger paintbrush and go through a really fast speed um, section of him just to show you how we kind of use other layers to manipulate. Now you notice my computer just started slowing down um, because he's a very high resolution image and I am manipulating pixels like crazy. Sometimes Photoshop's like, are you serious? So you can go into your preferences and re reduce the amount of undo states that you have, which is going to free up more RAM, or you can just bite the bullet and get a decent computer. <laughs> um, but I'm going to go through here and just goof around really fast here just to get a little more of him to show you how bad this, bad in a good way how sick, wicked, awesome this technique can be. Are you still using the same? Yeah, I'm using the same exact paintbrush. I changed the size a couple times, and the keystroke, if you want to change the size of your brush on the fly without having to go over here and use your slider, is you just take your bracket keys, which are just below your plus and minus key, and one bracket makes it big, one bracket makes it small. So as far as workflow, that's really nice. Let's paint in some of his famous hair. This is pretty, look how far back my... All right. Click on my piece of paper. There's part of Matt Damon's face. Now, what you then can do if you would like is go ahead and do the old sketchy trick. Matt Damon, desaturated, awesome, evil Matt Damon, <laughs> color dodge, blur, gushing blur, drawing of Matt Damon, <coughs> okay, click. Merge layers, put it on top of everything, throw the paper on there, go from normal to multiply. Suddenly we have a little bit more detail on Matt Damon. 
We can adjust the opacity. We can erase out areas where we don't want detail. And then something that I really like to do is I'm going to come to this paint layer and I'm going to put a layer on top of it. So it's below drawing Matt Damon, but on top of our smudgy paint Matt Damon. And I call this free paint. And this is where, as an artist, I can make some decisions to make this even look more painterly. And that is by just simply grabbing a paintbrush, just a regular paintbrush, determining the size and shape, and then basically finding areas where I can block it in and have less of these little... The thing that I personally don't love is too many of these little striations. They look really wispy. It is a style, but I don't think it's a traditional style. So what I'll do is I'll come in here, get a paintbrush. I'll maybe put the opacity not at full strength so it gives me an opportunity to kind of click and click and click like I would with a, a real paintbrush. And then I use my option key. Your option key always gives you options in Photoshop. You notice when I push it, what happens to my paintbrush? Eye dropper. So I say, you know what, I like this highlight color, but I want to extend it and block this out a bit more. I eye dropper it. I'm on a free paint layer, which if I don't like it, I can get rid of. And I'm going to paint in a little more blocky part of his cheek. And then I'm going to grab this and I'm going to cut it off a little bit. I'm going to grab this dark color. And I'm going to just make some decisions on how to make him look a little more painterly. Again, by reducing the amount of colors that you're using, you're going to make it look more like a painting because you do have some blending that occurs on the canvas, but really, you know, good or great paintings are made up of very simple colors that are just dialed in the right way and that create form. What shortcut are you using to get the eyedropper? Just pushing my option key. I push it and then click and it sucks up the color of wherever it's touching. So you see how I'm going to use some of these wisps. I'm going to get rid of a little bit of it. <coughs> these areas where I have white showing, I'm going to go ahead and fill in those gaps. And this is giving me an opportunity a little bit just to dumb down my painting and maybe do make a few kind of artistic decisions of what I think might look better than just the smudge all on its own. Okay, so this is the part that if you're not used to doing art, you know, you might say, oh crap, you don't have to do this, but it does, in the end, make a pretty big difference. Oops. You can see there to there, we're getting a little more like a painting. And then I can adjust the opacity and I say, you know what, that's what I did, but I don't want it to go full bore, I just want it to be a subtle change, right? Add a little bit of sketchy over the top. The bad part about my sketchy is it shows a little bit of grain on him, which would not be part of a real painting. So how do I deal with that? Eraser. Erase it, right? Get my eraser, make it big and soft, <coughs> using my bracket key. All I really care about those details are maybe it helps a little bit in his hair, helps a little bit around his eyes, his nose, where I need some definition. But all the other stuff, I don't want it because it makes it, it lets people know that I'm not a real painter. <laughs> Right? So if you guys trust me on this, which I think you do, you can make a pretty freaking great painting very easily and uh, in a pretty short amount of time. From here, you can then add some of the thickness layers. You can add your signature. And again, you can add those papers. So I could say, you know what? Matt Damon is rocking, but how much better would he look on this kind of yellowy canvas, which looks like it's part of a, this war theme. So I pull it over, click OK. Where did it go? Or did I click the wrong button? There we are. So now it's over the top. I change from normal to multiply and pull it back. I could add other textures to it, give it a, a totally different look, right? I could even say, what would all this look like instead of being on a white piece of paper here if it were on a black piece of paper? Or, um, oops, kind of an, like 
a rusty ox blood. That's kind of something you see in painting sometimes. It's a little too red. But totally different feeling, right? But cool, I think. Question? No. No? All right. Are you going to clap? Were you going to clap? I'm just kidding. Um, so, in your folder, again, let me review. You have some uh, images that you can play with. You have uh, a movie. You have another movie in this art history brush. I'm not going to teach you how to use this, but this is another way to make a painting. I don't like it. But there's a movie on it, and I tell you how. You've got some backgrounds. You've got some edges in here. This is just one example of an edge that you could use as an overlay in your painting by reversing it to give it a different work. You've got some examples. You can say, you know what, I'm going to go into Frog and see how Kent made this and bust it down into individual pieces. You can see I started with a photo of a frog and a sketch and a bunch of stuff. So if you want to deconstruct it and figure out how to it's a composite of painting, that hopefully will be helpful. You've got Matt Damon, which is awesome. And uh, you've got your, your assignment, which I'll go over right now. Let's see. <clears throat> All right, so what I want from each of you is a custom painting, approximately 8.5 by 11. You can orient your sheet whichever way you want. Make sure that when you're painting, it's at at least 150 dots in every inch or points in every inch. If you want to make it more, great. Keeping in mind that the smudge tool will eat up a little bit of RAM, so the higher resolution, the more your computer could drag if you're on a slow computer. Printers are going to be much more forgiving with something like this as far as resolution than they are with the traditional photograph, so you can get away with a little less resolution. Um, I want you to hand that in next week. I want it to not be an image that I gave you. I want you to go find something that's meaningful that you want to paint. So it's another celebrity, or it's your kid, or it's your brother or sister, or it's a picture you took of delicate arch when you were in fourth grade. I don't, whatever you want to do, just make it meaningful. Use any of the techniques I've given you. Use, uh, you know, combinations of techniques if that's appropriate. Hopefully what this does is it gets you thinking about layers and layers and layers and blend modes and, and really how I'm trying to composite things from a very rough state or blocking Bob Ross beginning all the way to something that looks finished and done. And then again, hopefully if you like it, it's something you could print out and hang up yourself. You could manipulate it and do an Andy Warhol version where you have four different colors of the same painting and put them in a big square and call it modern art. Cool. Questions for the class? I'm going to hit stop on this screen thing.